the development of the wise virgins prior to October 22nd, 1844. If you came to October 22nd, 1844, and you had not been prepared for that crisis, you were going to demonstrate that you were a foolish virgin. Okay, the, the foolish and the wise virgins were both developed before the crisis. This is a prophetic example that is nailed down by inspiration. All right, so the, now remember, October 22nd, 1844, one of the things that it is in prophecy is it's the marriage. It was the marriage. Christ entered into the marriage on October 22nd, 1844. Amen. The fulfillment of more than one parable concerning the marriage. Amen. Right? So those that had made provision, those that had prepared the wise virgins, their character for the crisis, those that had prepared to enter into the marriage were the wise virgins in the parable. And the books of Daniel and Revelation are the same book. They have the same line teaching. And in Revelation 19, verse 9, it says, Blessed is he who is called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There is a blessing attached to being called to the marriage. And in Daniel 12, 12, it says, Blessed is he who comes to the 1335 days, which ended in 1843. Brothers and sisters, when did 1843 end? It ended on March 21st, 1844. Okay? So, there was a blessing to come to 1843, which really brought you right to the springtime of 1844. And the blessing of Daniel 12, 12, Books of Daniel and Revelation are the same book. Is the same blessing of Revelation 19.9. Blessed is he who is called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the blessing of being in that group in March of 1844 is if he has made provision for the coming crisis that was going to take place over the next seven months during the seven-month movement. Okay. And some of those that had made the provision they had prepared for the crisis, and they were blessed for so doing. Okay, dropping down to the next paragraph. A similar work will be accomplished when that other angel, represented in Revelation 18, gives his message. The first and second and third angel's message will need to be repeated. Dropping down to the, uh, you know, this here, when... I was, I was looking for this particular quote for, uh, and I'm familiar with this quote. Um, I've used this quote for at least 10 years, you know, so I, but I was preparing, I was preparing materials for some meetings that we just did a month ago in London. And there was a point in one of the presentations where I wanted this quote. Because I was dealing with Revelation 18, and you'll notice the third paragraph, it says, speaking of Revelation 18, it says, take each verse of this chapter and read it carefully, especially the last two. Now, I wanted that thought, because I wanted to point out that it's in the last couple of verses of Revelation 18 where probation closes. All right, I'm going to make that point. So I'm, I'm on the Ellen White CD wrong, and I think I, I just can't pull the words to bring, bring this up. No. Try these words, like if you know how the search engine works, type in the words and it, it gives you, you know, 25 hits and you go through each one. No, that's not it. I can think of some different words. And, it, and finally, after a long period of time, longer than normal, I'm reading through this quote and bam, there's a quote I've never seen before. Can you see the quote? Go, go over to page 106. The problem with page 106, and this is, this is in the notes we have, but I, I want to see this quote. It says, Now comes the word that I have declared that New York is to be swept away by a tidal wave. This I've never said. I have said, as I looked at the great buildings going up there story after story, what terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arise to shake terribly the earth. Then, the words of Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3, 
will be fulfilled. Amen. The whole of the 18th chapter of Revelation is a warning of what is coming on the earth. But I have no light in particular in regard to what is coming to New York. Only I know that one day the great buildings there will be thrown down by the turning and overturning of God's power. From the light given me, I know that destruction is in the world. One word from the Lord, one touch of his mighty power, and these massive structures will fall. Scenes will take place, that fearfulness of what we cannot imagine. And brothers and sisters, you read that a few times. What she's saying is when the great buildings of New York City are thrown down, Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3 is fulfilled. And I immediately started sending this quote out to, to people on the email list. And then I went back to my work, and the very next thing I tried to pull up this quote we're reading, it came up. Okay. So this, we're back on page one of the quote. So you're saying the Lord led you this one? I know, I just tell this story. Yes. I can't say it. <laughs> 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 um, when that happens, it shows up page. She says in there, Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3 will be fulfilled. And when you pull it all together, she's saying when the mighty buildings of New York City are thrown down, then the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down. That's amazing. And Adventists have always correctly understood, brothers and sisters, that we need to take one more step. Adventists have always correctly understood that when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down, the latter rain begins to sprinkle. People do not like to hear that, but... People did not like to hear the latter rain message either. All right. I have a I have a friend that I've worked with for years, and he's he's a professor at a university, or not at a university, but he teaches homiletics. And when he works around me, I, I'm a really stumbling block for him because I obviously don't know homiletics. But he tries to uh, he tries to help. Me. Uh, uh, and uh, he told me that sometimes when you when the audience starts doing what you guys want to do, so you start talking about yourself, there's certain techniques that you can use to bring the focus back in. One is that you can just get quiet. <laughs> you get quiet and everyone else gets quiet. And or another one is you can just throw in a, a story like I just did that really doesn't have anything to do with the message and get their attention back and start that. Okay, so yeah. now your attention yeah. is back. Pardon me. Yes. <laughs> you kind of brought up the scripture that goes along with that text in Isaiah. It says that the power Now, well, there's a lot of places we can go with that. Okay. <clears throat> Um, and I, I'm choosing not to go with that. She's, she's had, when, once you start getting to that point, you can pull in a lot of things in connection with that. Um, like it says, when it mentions destruction in there, um, Revelation 9-11 talks about Islam having a king over them. And in the Hebrew tongue, it's Apollyon, and the, or maybe vice versa, in the Greek, it's Abaddon. Hebrew and Greek, Old and New Testament, Apollyon, Abaddon. What's that mean? Destruction, the destroyer, death and destruction is associated with Islam. And we're going to read here in the near future day that the, um, the horse, the wild horse of Islam brings death and destruction in its path and it symbolizes the four winds that are restrained. And we know that when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down, the four winds of strife are restrained. And Sister White says those four winds are represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose, loose and bring death and destruction on the earth. And Sister White it says these charts are directed by the hand of the Lord, and Islam on both these charts is this horse she's speaking about. And on September 11, 2001, Islam is restrained as the four winds were being restrained, and the ceiling of 144,000 began to. There's many places you can go there. You can jump into Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11, where the destruction in New York City is mentioned, but also its reference with Daniel 11. And in 
referencing Daniel 11, it says that final movements will be rapid movements. This is a, a big, big subject. So I agree with you, there's places you can go, but. 9 11. 9 11 in Thessalonians. 9 11 in Revelation. Yeah, it's, it's a whole thought. Um, now, so we're I'm back on page 104, the fourth paragraph of this passage from Manuscript Releases, Volume 16, page 270. The parable of the ten virgins was given by Christ himself, and every specification should be carefully studied. So there's several specifications in the parable of the ten virgins. She said we should understand them all. And then she emphasizes one of those specifications above all the others. She says a time will come when the door will be shut. We are represented either by the wise or the foolish virgins. We cannot now distinguish, nor have we authority to say who are wise and who are foolish. There are those who hold the truth in unrighteousness, and these appear outwardly like the wise. Um, so part of, part of what's taking place here in its history, not only in the Millerites, but in the history of Revelation 18, is the close of probation, the closing of doors. And there are two, a two-step closing. Judgment begins in the house of God. The house of God is tested first. Out the door of probation closes for the house of God. And then the 11th hour workers are tested. And I have a question that will answer later on if the question and answers about who are the 11th hour workers. That phrase is that state, that symbol is a symbol Sister White uses to describe those of God's other children that are still in Babylon. <coughs> they come out. Sometimes she calls them the one hour labor, and it's taken from the parable of the vineyard of Christ, where um, the workers that were working all day long in the vineyard for, uh, for a penny, they get to the eleventh hour, and he calls in more workers, and the eleventh hour workers, they get the same pay, they get the penny, but that's what that phrase is from. And the eleventh hour workers, or the one hour laborers, which is the same um, verbiage from that parable, are called out of Babylon to stand with God's people during the one hour of Revelation 17, when the ten kings uh, co-rule with the beast for one hour. And this one hour is a subject of prophecy. You take the Bible Concordance and you look up one hour, wherever you see the one hour in the New Testament, it's speaking about this one hour of Revelation 17. It begins with the Sunday law in the United States and goes until Michael stands up and human probation is closed. I'll give you an example. When the Bible tells us, the New Testament tells us that we're going to be brought before judges and magistrates, but do not worry because in that hour, it will be given to you what to speak. That is the hour of the Sunday law crisis, from the Sunday law in the United States until human probation closes. There's only one book in the Old Testament that uses this word hour. It's not an accident that that book is Daniel, and it's mentioned in Daniel four times. The word hour is mentioned in Daniel four times, twice in one story, and there's three stories where it's mentioned. The one is Belshazzar's fall of Babylon. In the very same hour, a hand comes and writes, many men tackle you far That hour is the one hour of the Sunday law till human probation closes when Babylon is falling and the message is Babylon is falling. The other place in Daniel where you find this term one hour is in the very same hour Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was taken to him, from him. Babylon is fallen. And the other illustration of our in the Old Testament is in the book of Daniel is, is in the same hour he took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and he threw them into the fiery furnace because from the Sunday law in the United States, the human probation closes. In that prophetic hour, that's when God's people are thrown into the fiery furnace. But a fourth appears, a three-one combination, and the world will look at that, and they will see Christ and the eleventh-hour laborers by seeing Christ in Shadrach, Shemeshach, and Abednego in the fire, in the crisis. They come out of Babylon and stand with them. That makes them the other eleventh-hour work. <laughs> so, in this time period, there are two closes of probation. First, with the church. Then, with the eleventh hour workers, when Michael stands up on the top of page 105, it says, Oh, that the people of God might know the time of their visitation. There are many of whom have not yet heard the testing truth of this time. There are many with whom the Spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgment. 
This is the one hour. The time of God's destructive judgment begins with the Sunday law of the United States. National apostasy is followed by national ruin. The time of God's destructive judgment is a time of mercy for those who have had no opportunity to learn for what is truth. It's a time of mercy for the eleventh hour workers, for the children of God that are still in battle. But generally will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is stretched out to save, while the door is closed to those Seventh-day Adventists that would not enter prior to that testing time. The door is closed to those Seventh-day Adventists who will not enter into the final opportunity of character development that's taking place right here, right now. Our door is closing now. And when it closes at the Sunday law, then the second door begins to close on the left of our workers. The loud cry, sometimes called Revelation 18, the loud cry, and uh, this is correct. And the manuscript releases volume 9, page 291, says, The truth for this time, the third angel's message, is to be proclaimed with a loud voice, meaning increasing, with increasing power. The, the term loud cry that we derive from Revelation 18, when this angel joins the third angel, is not simply a shout, it, it's an escalating process. And brothers and sisters, it corresponds with the escalating increase of knowledge. Right? This, this increase of knowledge that begins when a prophecy is fulfilled and, and a prophecy is unsealed, shedding light upon the future events, it increases and escalates. The present truth for this time comprising the messages, the third angel's message, message succeeding the first and second, comprises the messages, the third angel's message succeeding the first and second. The presentation of this message with all it embraces is our work. We stand as the remnant people in these last days to promulgate the truth and swell the cry of the third angel's wonderful, distinct message, giving this trumpet a certain sound. The eternal truth which we appear to from the beginning is to be maintained in all its increasing importance to the close of probation. What's the internal, eternal truth that we've held from the beginning? It's right there on that chart. We've held that from the beginning. The trumpet is to give no uncertain sound. The message is to come to all the church, to the churches. We are to consider the best plans for accomplishing this. Faith, eternal faith, in the past and the present truth, is to be taught, is to be prayed, and is to be presented with pen and voice. The third angel's message, in its clear, definite terms, is to be made prominent. The prominent warning, all that it comprehends, is to be made intelligible to the reasoning minds of today. Praise the Lord. One of the arguments against this message is that when we're suggesting that the latter rain is sprinkling, and therefore that this is the latter rain message, one of the arguments is, brothers, brother, you know, the, the that message is the message that Jones and Wagner brought, which is righteousness by faith, and they weren't saying anything about these prophetic events that, that you're suggesting. Let's read one of the most famous quotes along that line. The time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin pardon redeemer. This is the end of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. Is that what it says? It's the beginning. And what's the beginning of every reform movement? It's the darkness, but I'm talking about the primary way mark. What's the work of the Holy Spirit? To convict the sin of righteousness and judgment. The beginning of the work is the conviction of sin. And that message of Jones and Wagner was to lift up before the world the Savior on the cross to convict of sin. That's the beginning of every reform movement. And that's what Jones and Wagner brought was the beginning. And for those of us to use that teaching to say, I don't want to hear anymore, we're making a terrible, deadly, eternal mistake. Amen. That was the beginning. And through our own actions, we stopped that. And it's being repeated. And the first step of the reform movement at the end, we've already identified more than once here, is a conviction of sin. Brothers and sisters, if the latter rain truly began to sprinkle on September 11, 2001, there's never been a more serious 
message that convicts us of sin. Because we know that we either sin our sins beforehand to judgment or we're going to be lost in the very near future. So let's not stumble over those arguments. Let's remember that we've been forewarned that when the latter rain message comes, it'll probably come in a way that we do not expect and that it has been illustrated that God's people, because of their preconceived ideas, are going to be unwilling to accept it. Okay? The next few quotes have to do with angels representing the work of the people of God. We've read these before. We've pointed to them before. You can read them on your own time. The angel of Revelation 18 is not representing an angel. It's representing what the three angels of Revelation 14 represent. It re represents the work that is accomplished by God's people during that time period. And you'll see Revelation 18, verses 1 through 5 on your pages, on your page 106. And below that, you see a quote that we've referred to more than once. 1888 materials, page 804. God has given the messages of Revelation 14 their place in the line of prophecy, and their work is not to cease till the close of this earth's history. The first and second angels' messages are still true for this time, and are to run parallel with that which follows. And what we have said more than once is that in 1798, the time of the end, the first angel's message technically arrives. It begins an increase of knowledge. August 11, 1840, the year day principle is confirmed before the world, and Miller's message is empowered for the first angel's message, when the mighty angel of Revelation 10 comes down. In June of 1842, the Protestant churches closed their doors against the message of the Millerite. On October 22, 1844, the third angel's message arrives in history. What we're suggesting is that in 1989, as identified in the very same verse that we identify 1798 in Daniel 11 40, the time of the end began for the 144,000 with the collapse of the Soviet Union, brought about by an alliance between the United States and Vatican. This fulfillment of prophecy shed light upon the upcoming history because it identified that the movement for the papacy to return to the throne of the earth was underway, and the returning of the papacy to the throne of the earth is the third angel's message, because when she returns to the throne of the earth, the mark of the beast is enforced upon the whole world. The, the next verse that we're going to deal with is verse 41 of Daniel 11. This is the line of Daniel 11. So, from 1989 to verse 41, which is the Sunday law in the United States, this includes the history of 2001. Certainly, the Soviet Union collapsing in 1989 is specifically in reference to verse 40. But verse 40, the history of verse 40 continues until verse 41 is fulfilled when the King of the North enters the glorious land. Alright? So, in this sense, verse 40 in 2001, the mighty angel came down, paralleling 1840. Alright? Now, we have not spent much time on this, but I want to spend a little time here just repointing to it. Not that it's been in it, because we haven't got time to go and read the verses. So when the book came in, the city of Babylon was still very good. Pardon me? When the book came in, the city of Babylon had to go to verse 41. No. Because in verse 40, when he enters the glorious land, he's, he's conquering it. And the, the Hebrew experts in Adventism will tell you the Hebrew of verses 40 to 46 is like identifying a, um, a, a warfare movement, a progressive movement. Uh, and he begins this warfare in verse 40, and it's a march, okay, until he comes to his end. And therefore, um, when he enters the glorious land, it's identifying that he enters the glorious land the same way that he entered 
the countries that the King of the South is conquering is being illustrated, and we know that the papacy conquers uh, the United States at the Sunday Law, and we know too that at that point the message to come out of Babylon starts, and in verse 41 we have identified Edom, Moab, and Ammon as those that are escaping the hand of the papacy to come out of that time. And verse 41 is the Sunday Law in the United States, and if you look closely, if you look closely at verses 41 and 42, in connection with Sister White's comments. Sister White, and if you get the time of the end magazine, if you're not familiar with this, I can only point you at this because of time. Sister White says very specifically that the Sunday Law test first arrives in the United States, and then every country on the globe follows her example. Okay? That's, the, that's the divine sequence. That's the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy says, when the test comes, it's first the United States and then the rest of the world. The second testimony to that is Daniel. He says, first the Sunday law arrives in the United States in verse 41, and then the king of the north conquers Egypt, which symbolizes the world. So you have the United States, the world, second testimony from Daniel. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that for this reason. When the mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down in 1840, it's at this time, in verses 8 through 10, that John is told by the angel, go and take the little book out of the angel's hand, and eat it, and it will be sweet in your mouth. And why am I saying that he takes it in 1840? I'm saying it because the little book of Daniel became sweet in the Millerite's mouth on August 11, 1840, because the predictions that they were making were based upon the year-day principle. And on August 11, 1840, the year-day principle had been confirmed before the world, and their message became very sweet. All right? So they ate the little book on August 11, 1840, and Jeremiah and Ezekiel teaches, at this point, a testing process began. Right. Probably everybody knows, but I just want to make it clear that there are some that don't. What happened that day? I know you've already said it. To establish the year day. Okay, hey, what happened that day is that, and we, we said it more than once, so I don't know that I should have to say it again, but for you, I will. Well, thank you. The, the, well, I'm, because I just will. The way we're dealing with this history has, has been very specific that Josiah Litch in 1838, it's on your notes if you got it from his work up, he put into print something that every Millerite preacher preached. Don't misunderstand your <coughs> controversy. When Sister White talks about Josiah Litch putting into pamphlet a prediction that the Ottoman Empire was going to collapse on August 11, 1840, based upon the time prophecy in Revelation 9.15. He wasn't standing alone. Every Millerite preacher preached it. It's right here on the chart. Okay, what Josiah Lynch did, different than the other preachers, is he wrote it down. Okay, he put it into a publication, predicting the end of the world in advance, or predicting what they believed was the close of probation, was going to take place on August 11th, 1840, and he was scoffed at and laughed at. But when it came to pass, Sister White in great controversy, a wonderful impetus was added to the Advent movement. And in other places, she said, at that point, hundreds of ministers from every other denominations came and stood with the Millerites. The year day principle had been confirmed. The point is this. The eighth little book in 1840, and based upon the line upon lines that we've been sharing with you, when the divine symbol comes down, a testing process begins. John ate the little book. When Ezekiel ate the little book, when Jeremiah ate the little book, a testing process is identified. In this line of reform in the time of Christ, when the dove came down on Christ, at the baptism, he immediately went into the desert to be tested. In the line of Moses, when the Lord came down and confronted Moses with the, the test of circumcision, circumcision is a test. At this point, the lines of prophecy tell us that a testing process begins. You follow my logic? When the, when the divine symbol comes down, you eat the little book, 
and the testing process begins. In the history of Christ, this testing process is identified in early writings 259 we read. It. All those that would not receive the testimony of John the Baptist could not be benefited by the teachings of Jesus. They went still further and crucified him, and they could therefore see no light into the holy place. Okay, that was that testing process. And then she talks about the testing process in the Millerites. You don't receive the first angel's message, you can't receive the second angel's message. Do you see that in the reform movements, the testing process begins when the mighty angel comes down? Okay, now, now here's what I want you to see. You've already agreed to another truth. The testing process has been identified. It begins in the United States. And then where's the book? So when the Protestant churches closed their doors in 1842, it's telling us that the testing process is done in the United States and it goes to the world. All right? You see it? They've had a test. They closed their doors. And, the, and in 1842, the test goes to the world. The brothers and sisters, in verse 42, the papacy conquers the world in this testing process. Okay. You follow me? Okay. And then in, in 1843, the 1335 prophecy is fulfilled. Blessed is he who comes to the marriage supper of the Lamb. All right. This, this here is marking the spot where the wise virgins have prepared themselves to enter into the marriage is seven months later, as they go through the seven-month movement. Because this, this year ends, March 21st, 1844. All right. Okay, so what am I saying? Uh, that in, in paralleling this history of Revelation 18, in verse 40 of of Daniel 11, we see the mighty angel come down because 2001 is part of the history of verse, of verse 4. Um, the next thing, and this, this mighty angel here, with his foot upon the land and the sea, representing a worldwide message, and on September 11, 2001, the entire world saw what happened. The second angel's message in the Millerite time period was fulfilled in the USA. And the next mark of prophecy here in verse 41 is the USA. So this is, this is just a different way to be approaching, um, what, um, Jamal was putting on the board last night. In verse 43 of Daniel 11, the king of the north, he's conquered the king of the south, he's conquered the glorious land, and he's conquered Egypt. In verse 43, still talking about Egypt, it says, the king of the north has now in his possession the gold and the silver and the precious things. Which is definitely identifying when the papacy takes control of the financial structure of the world. That's one truth that's there. But another truth is that is there is that at this point, the papacy has received its wedding presents. Okay, you probably don't know what I mean, but, but what, I, what I mean is this. Is that we're seeing parallel histories here. Here, the, the, the guests for the wedding, for Christ's wedding, are prepared. But in this counterfeit history of the King of the North, she receives her wedding gifts. You'll see what I mean in a moment, Lord will. In verses 44 and 45, which are, could be considered as one verse, because of the message of the East and the North, because of the third angel's message, the king of the north begins a bloodbath and he comes to his end with none to help as Michael stands up in Daniel 12 1. And Daniel 12 1 says, and at that time, so in right reality, Daniel 12 1 is right back here in verses 44 and 45. And that's, that's why in 1844, judgment begins. And in verse 44 of Daniel 11, Judgment ends. Okay, there's, there's your parable. Alright. But we're dealing with Revelation 18. Let's look at Revelation 18. Okay. I understand. Except I don't understand. Let's go. One. 
12 and the first one are different than Daniel 12. Okay. I'm saying there's three verses in a row that are actually to be understood as one thought. Okay. Verses 44, 45, and verse 1. <laughs> no, I'm saying that on October 22nd, 1844, judgment began. Christ moved into the most holy place. But in this event here, we're seeing the close of judgment. There's your parallel. All right? I'm out of time. I'm not going to quit, though. But I... <laughs> I, I want you to think this through because it doesn't take very long, but I want you to see something here, all right? So so put your thinking caps on. This line ties things together that you're probably struggling with, all right? And rightly so. Rightly so. Let's read Revelation 18. Because what we're saying is that in Revelation 18 began on September 11, 2001. Revelation 18, verse 1. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. This is verse 1 of Revelation 18, when the mighty angel comes down. This is the same angel here, the angel of 2001. That's what we're saying. You have to test this through your own study. Okay. But this is verse 1. If you see that, say amen. Amen. Right. amen. So, verse 1, this is the fourth angel's message. Okay? Can you can you receive that? Amen. Fourth angel. Alright, now watch this. I want to show you something. This is the fourth angel's message. Right? And it lines up with verse 40, which lines up with 18 40. Okay? Let's read verse 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. When does this cry go off prophetically? It goes out to Sunday morning. Amen. Verse 2. But, I'm yeah. sorry. Just in case everybody didn't get it, on the 1840 and 9-11, uh, I think you should make the Islamic Covenant connection again, just briefly. Unless everybody's got that. No, no, no. Let me finish the thought. Okay. All right. This is this is too new, even for some people to follow this too. I agree with you. I'm going to set down a basic overview here, That's why and then we need to go back and and talk these through. But let's get the, the yeah. overview here. Babylon has fallen. Arrives in history in earnest at the Sunday Law in the United States. That standard. Adventist understanding. If you understand that, say amen. 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 Therefore, verse 2 of Revelation 18, okay, verse 2, is lining up with the, the Sunday law testing time. And the Sunday law testing time corresponds with this history because the Sunday law testing time ends in the United States, goes to the world. The test has been defined as a two step process in the United States in the world. Okay, so verse 2 lines up with verse 42 of Daniel 11 and 18, 42 of the Bill of History. Let's read verse 3. Let's read verse 3. Oh, some of you are still looking at the board. Let's read verse 3. <laughs> For all nations have drunk of the wine of her fornication. And there's three parts to this verse. For all nations have drunk the wine of her fornication. What's the primary wine of Rome's fornication that's under discussion here? The Sunday law. This is the Sunday law. They have also, it says, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And what's fornication? A, an unlawful relationship. In fact, this is where the ten kings agree to give their kingdom to the beast. In fact, this is where the marriage is consummated. 
Okay. Yeah. It's consummated here. And notice the next phrase. The unholy wedding. Yes. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacy. The guests at this marriage are the merchants of the earth that think this marriage is wonderful. So verse 3, brothers and sisters, of Revelation 18 corresponds with the point in time when the papacy in verse 43 of Daniel 11 receives the weddings of its marriage, the wedding gifts at its marriage. Because it's in verse 3 that the marriage is consummated, the kings have drank the wine, and the merchants of the earth are there to celebrate the marriage. And in verse 43 we see the marriage gifts given to the bride of Rome, and it's paralleling. 1843, when the wise virgins have prepared themselves to enter into the true way. All right. Let's look at verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sin, and ye receive not of her plagues. The last call. Verse 44 in its truest sense, verse 4, in its truest sense, is what we call the loud cry message, and it corresponds with the loud cry message of verse 44 of Daniel 11, the tidings from the east of the north, which corresponds with the midnight cry that was given in 1844. So verse 4, Lines up with verse 44 and 1844. That's not an accident. No way. That makes that first history pretty important. <laughs> so, to answer the brother's question, and this, and I really, I don't need to answer this question because this is, this is ahead, but the point I think he's making. In the Millerite history, what marks this event, the fulfillment of the prophecy of Revelation 9.15, is when the four great European powers came together to restrain Islam. Right? Mm -hmm. Islam was restrained at that point. Okay? The reason they were restrained is they were trying to bring on the third jihad. Okay? They were trying to bring on the third jihad in Islamic mind, and it's in this history that Luke 21 25 says one of the signs of the Millerite history was the distress of nations. The distress of nations was Islam trying to bring in the third jihad. Yeah. And on August 11th, 1840, the four great European powers interceded to put a restraint on Islam. And the number four is worldwide. So on 2001, George Bush went to the United Nations and so we're now in a worldwide war with on terrorism, and you're either for us or against us, and the whole world, represented by the four European kings, came together to put a restraint on Islam, September 11th, 2001. The mighty angel came down when Islam was restrained in 1840, the mighty angel came down when Islam was restrained in 2001, and the mighty angel came down in 2001 in the great cities. And the great buildings of New York City were thrown down, and Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3, was fulfilled. But we have more to say about Islam. What we were doing here is just laying out that Revelation 18, the, the third angel is to run parallel with the first two, and give you some of the structure of Revelation 18. Jeff, wouldn't it be better to say that? Revelation 18, verse 1 was fulfilled because part 2, the National Sunday Law hasn't happened yet, and there hasn't been a cry. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. It, it's, for the record, it's not in the tape. It's saying, wouldn't it be better when referring to this quote, um, to point at this point to verse 1 of Revelation 18, when Sister White says, then the words of Revelation 18, verse 1 through 3 will be fulfilled. Isn't it better to say at this point, on 2001, Verse 1 is fulfilled. I don't have a problem with that because these events are all connected. They're progressive. What we're marking here, what the Lord is marking for us here, is that the, this sequence of events has arrived 
and that the mighty angel has come down. But yes, uh, Sunday law is to follow, uh, and then the entire world being brought together. After that, the United States in Revelation 13, verse 14, goes to the entire world and says, you must set up an image of the beast. And that comes after verse 11. After the Sunday law in the United States, the United States deceives the world and tells them they must set up an image of the beast. That's the ten kings agreeing to give their kingdom to the beast for one hour. That's um, verse 3 here. When the marriage is consummated and the papacy receives its wedding gifts, <laughs> the wise virgins come into the blessed hour in order to the smooth of the marriage. Yeah, it, well, the, the question is, is the prediction of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire by Josiah Lynch was there two messages? And the answer is yes. He printed a publication in 1838, and all he said I believe, was that in August 11th, 1840, the Ottoman Empire would collapse. But shortly before August 11th, just a few weeks before that, he went in and he really fine-tuned his studies, and then he, he decided he had it, and he, he put in print, no, not just August 1840, it's August 11th, 1840. Right. It was two weeks before the event. Two weeks before. Okay. One thing I might like to point out is that Belshazzar's speech that we looked at in Daniel 4, this is why it makes this very important statement about his ruin. That he would not receive. Five. A, Go ahead. It's five, Daniel 5. It's only four. Five. Belshazzar's speech, and uh, he would not accept the message that had come to him through the experience of his grandfather. And it says there that he would not humble himself. And the reason the world is coming to this scene is because they will not humble themselves before the cross of Christ. And seven day Adventists need to get this message loud and clear. This is a message of humility. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Human beings need to be understand that this is the reform movement that God is bringing forth in the earth. Mm -hmm. Belshazzar didn't get the message. And it cost him his kingdom and his eternal life. That, that's a good explanation, but let's go one step closer. Adventism isn't receiving this message because they will not accept the testimony of their grandfather. The world also is faced with the same dilemma. And when it, when it comes to the personal issue, it's telling to me personally that I must receive these messages and humble myself. God is asking me to put myself away to separate myself from me and accept this message of divine truth. And what's the, the, what's the price connected with that if we do? We'll uh, heal our man. Heal our right. This, this is the repairing of the breach. This again, as there's so many promises in this. This is the repairing of the breach. Yes. It begins in us. Personally. Is there anybody besides yourself that is preaching and is sharing and teaching the same message in the world? No. It, 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 you yes. would have asked me that 10 years ago, I would have said, well, there's very few, but I personally know men on every continent in the globe that are teaching this message. Yeah. I appreciate Amen. It. Amen. Plus, Except uh, Iceland, <laughs> but I have a friend in Romania that is teaching this message, and he's working at a self-supporting institution there, he's managing it, and he's supported by some rich Adventists in Iceland, so I even think Iceland knows about it. Have we had any hits from Iceland on the web? Have you any hits on from Uh, I don't, I don't think so, I'll have to check. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to watch the work you're accomplishing as you're unfolding this light before our eyes and as you're building this light upon the foundations that you established through the work of your consecrated servants during the whole life history. We know that in that history there were mistakes made by the men and women that participated, and we are just as capable of even more so than the mistakes today. We ask that you give us discernment to um, not repeat those errors of the past, um, but also give us conviction that we need to test these things. Yes. One brother here has been asking repeatedly for a complete, thorough um, 
explanation of this chart that you've given us, I was referring back to what Brother Delaney said in all of us, the fact that we have to take these truths and make them our own. We that have had dealt with these truths for a while, we definitely have the responsibility of how to teach these things. But no matter what the teachers are doing, each of us in this room has to personally make this work that we think of at that moment because we understand that the work of coming to understand this message is part of the sanctified process that you will gain through the people who you said sanctified and true and the work of my word is truth. Amen. Amen.